Hi guys, welcome back. We are going to now move on to learning outcome 2.2. So let me quickly share my screen. Okay, so what we are now going to do is we're going to look at um, critically discussing the role, significance, and adaptation of the short story form within and across the prescribed short story. So what I'm going to be doing in this section is we're going to discuss the, the traditional form of the short story and we're going to contrast it to how Raymond Carver's short stories are structured, in particularly in reference to um, the modern um, postmodernist attempt and postmodernist view of short story writing. Now, I've put a little note here. It is not essential reading, but I have used a lot of ideas coming from the uh, Sesido or Sekido reading that is available for you on BC Learn, and it is called Modernism, Postmodernism, and the Short Story in English. Um, and if you want to, it is a very dense reading, but it is a very important reading. It's very useful for you to engage with in terms of understanding how the short story has come to change and adapt from modernism to postmodernism, particularly. So I'm going to be stealing a couple of ideas from there. So the first thing that I'm going to point out is just do a little mind refresher of a short story. Now I've stolen this this little um, picture, but something I do want to keep in mind here is that this structure where you have your thing exposition, you have your conflict, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution, this plot structure is not uncommon. Um, and in fact, not only is this traditional for short stories, often you will find in really traditional old literature this is the structure, you know, this is how stories were originally and traditionally told, particularly if you're looking at plays and if you're looking at the old texts, um, all the way up until the 1800s, this was very normal, this was a very traditional way of telling stories. So, um, I've, I've also stolen this, which I think is quite cool, which is a seven point story structure, which says, one, you have a character, two, they're in a situation, three, with a problem. Four, they try to solve this problem. Five, they fail and make it worse. Six, they make a final attempt which may succeed or fail. And seven, the consequences which are not as expected. So sometimes the consequences are completely, and most often in a, in a short story, radically different. Now, this is a very traditional short story structure. If you look at very traditional short stories from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, this is how short stories were often told very traditionally structured and very effective because you can literally pinpoint where these moments are. Now, we know that's not how, particularly if you're looking at the Raymond Carver stories, that's not how these stories work. They are not that clear cut. And I'm going to reference a specific couple to keep that in mind about how wildly different they are from what you expect them to be. So if you think about it, a lot of the time, modernism created this very traditional structure of short storytelling. And it wasn't just modernism, but it did come to sort of a peak in modernism, where the short story narrative was very clear. It had this very clear structure, and a lot of the time it had a very clear perspective and character that we were engaging with. You would have a character with a name, with a few characteristics that we could either relate to or understand, and we could identify them. Now, I've been very cheeky and I've chosen to um, book uh, film covers, but they, they do the job just as well. If you think about these two, these two are two of the most um, successful adaptations of short stories into films. And these characters are very identifiable. You know exactly what short story I'm talking about. And if you've watched the films or read the stories, you know what the events are. There is nothing hugely surprising here. And these are very clear. When you are engaging with these stories, these are not unfamiliar. You know which character you're experiencing from. You can see how the character is going to unfold, how the story will break into its various components. And we can clearly follow it from one step to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And there is no wild surprises in terms of understanding how the characters are thinking and how they're behaving and, and engaging with that. Because there is a very set structure that we're going to follow. And one of the things that uh, modernism really focused on was the fact that your subject was often your protest of the narrative and they followed 
a very clear structure in terms of we could identify them. We knew who our protagonist was, we can probably ad attach a few characteristics to them, and we knew what their name was. And we were happy with that. There was something very clear-cut and identifiable about that in terms of storytelling. Now, you should originally, in the back of your mind, have a few bells warning, because something you might have noticed is that there are a lot of characters in our Raymond Carver, where the stories, where we don't know their names. And you might not even have characteristics that you can identify as relating to these. You can identify them probably as male or female. You might have a name if you're lucky. And aside from that, sometimes it's very difficult to give them clear, definable aspects. We don't know what they look like. We might not know how they behave very clearly in a situation because sometimes they are merely witnessing a situation. And a lot of the time, there is a, ses a sense of disconnect between how what we perceive the narrator to be and what we expect a narrator in a short story to be. And Raymond Carver wanted to dislocate this for us. He wanted to make it a different reading experience, where instead of just going in with a very clear understanding of how a short story should be written, he turns that on its head with our subject and the narrators that we're going to experience. Now, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about narrators in super amount of depth now, because we're going to do a whole section on that in the next um, learning outcome. But I do want you to keep it brooding and percolating at the back of your mind about what is a narrator and what is their role. So keep that in the back of your head. So if we know that our traditional modernist stories have a very traditional structure, they have a very traditional narrator, very traditional way of engaging with stories. How are our postmodern stories different? I've kind of already given you a frisson of how these are different. I've kind of given you an idea, but we're going to break it down more explicitly now. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to highlight the two things that we might want to take note of. So one of the things here is that we will very rarely have an opening exposition in our stories. Very rarely will Carver try and position us somewhere where we can look at the world and get used to it before the action happens. So sometimes you will have your inciting moment or your conflict already wham bam in the first lines and there's no surprises there. Sometimes you will start off with that. You will start in the middle of the action and take it from there. Sometimes you will start with a moment of conflict and then backtrack to give us some exposition and explanation and then go back to our climax. This happens particularly in um, Are These Actual Miles, where we start in the middle of an action and then we backtrack to get some backstory. So sometimes we will often have, so the first thing that I want you to note is that Carver often gets rid of this exposition moment. He doesn't necessarily want us to have a whole lot of context to go with because he wants us to dive straight into the action and sort of pick up the plot as we go along. Sometimes what will happen is we will also, we will almost always very rarely have any resolution. There is very rarely a conclusion to our story. But something else to think about is that often he will leave the story off just as the climax is supposed to occur. And the climax of the story sometimes is the last line. And I'm going to take two examples that I think this is most clear in. Um, in a serious talk, we have the husband attempt to kill his separated or, or distant wife and children. Um at least once in the story, but this is not the, the climactic moment. The climactic moment is the end when he says they're going to have a serious talk at some point. And you get the implication that he's brooding and plotting something in the future. And therefore, this is just kind of a, a prequel to what is going to happen next. And in um, the other story, which is, I'm going to probably reference the most because I think it is one of the most effective, is So Much Water So Close to Home. The last line of the story is actually what inverts the whole story on its head. We actually get quite a lot of um, events and moments in the story where things are happening. We have a funeral, we have a murder, we have a death, we have the narration of, of the men going away and finding this body, supposedly, and we have all of this, and we have the backtrack of their relationship, we get moments with the, the son um, and Claire, the mother, but the actual moment of climax is when Claire finally confronts her husband and says the final line. 
um, which really turns the whole thing on its head because um, up until that point, right up until that last line, you have some preconception of what has happened and suddenly you go, oh, oh, maybe that's not what actually happened in the story. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind in terms of plot structure is that um, Carver has thrown this traditional idea of plot structure out the window. He has chosen when his climactic moment will happen and he shuffled them along. And he does not always believe in, and very rarely is there any form of resolution to these stories. 90% of the time, what will happen at the end of these stories is you are left with the sort of sense of impending doom or something awful is going to happen next, and we have no idea what it is. And these moments are almost like we're realizing we're only seeing vignettes of these people's lives. So something to keep in mind is that the plot structure is completely different from our traditional structure of a plot. Next, what I want to refer to is how the narrative and the plot and the structure, and if we're talking about it, the sujet and our fabula, how much of it is completely fragmented. So something that we forget about is the fact that we are used to stories being told in a very chronological manner. And if stories are not told in a chronological manner, we have guiding moments that tell us when we're jumping back and forth between flashbacks or moments. And Carver doesn't do that. He doesn't signpost it for us. He doesn't give us um, dates or times. He doesn't give us um, a sentence that leads into it. All he does is he shifts very dramatically from one moment to the next. And he does that for a very specific purpose. One of the reasons why he does this is because he doesn't necessarily write in stream of consciousness, but he does want to show you how unbelievably um, illogical our own thought processes are as humans. We do not have a clear, normal structure to our experiences in life, and therefore we jump between moments all the time. And our experiencing of something is incredibly fragmented. We will not often retell a story very clearly because we will often be like, this happened, this happened, oh wait, but this also happened this, but when did this happen? And therefore our retelling of something is fragmented because we are focusing on certain aspects, but not every aspect. For example, how many of you go home and you're asked by whether it's partner or family or friends, how was your day? You don't tell them in chronological order every single thing that happened. Not only would that be incredibly boring, but you're only going to focus on what really is important. You going and eating a sandwich is not that exciting unless it's a very good sandwich. You are going to tell them a fragmented set of events, and probably you're going to focus on the things that really stood out to you when things went wrong, or something exciting happened, or something you really enjoyed. And that's what Carver's trying to do. He's trying to replicate the human experience by fragmenting how these stories are told. But he's also doing something on a secondary level, which is to show that these stories are manufactured. He's trying to show us how a lot of the time when a story is put together, it is not necessarily put together for the smoothness of the story, but rather so that we can experience the story to its utmost um, best form. And so what he's saying is every story you've read before now is going to be highly constructed. And I know this is a highly constructed story, but it might be more real to you because it represents how you would experience something far more accurately than those previous short stories that you have read. So he's not necessarily critiquing former stories and the way that traditional stories are told, but he's definitely highlighting how the lived experience of an individual is not smooth and transitional the way we experience it. It's much more choppy and fragmented, and it's much more based on what we are interested in rather than the actual events being told in order. Something that we're going to talk a lot about, and we're going to talk about this in more depth, um, is the lack of a subject, or the loss of the subject. And what this is in reference to is, as I said, we have sometimes narrators that might not have any actual actions taking place in the story. Sometimes they are just witnesses to the story, or sometimes they are characters are sort of distant from the narrative. And what I mean by distance is they might be experiencing it, but they might not be the main characters. And therefore, the things that happen to everyone else are far more important than the things that happen to them. Um, and a good example of this, I think, is the example of the narrative of vitamins. 
And what we're actually focused on in this example is we're not that interested in the main character or our, our subject's view. We're not that interested in following our narrator. We are far more interested in the characters of Patty, Sheila, and Donna. And we're much more interested in the character of Patty because she's a beautiful one who's very, she's a workaholic, she's very successful, um, and she's the main girlfriend. We're interested in Donna because she's sort of cheating on both her best friend and um, and she's kind of encouraging her best friend's boyfriend to cheat on with her, um, and Sheila, who is in love with Patty. So we have all of these little frissons of relationship complexities. And Vitamins is all about how we are engaging with these women and how these women, these modern and more um, sophisticated, independent women, are existing within a traditionally male world and how these men treat them so incredibly badly. And our view, which is through the lens of this very male protagonist who has absolutely no qualms about going on a date with Dan Donna, as, even though he's dating Patty, and being awful to Sheila because she happens to be in love with Patty, even though he's cheating on Patty with Donna. You see the complexities there. And he has no qualms about it. And he doesn't protect Donna when she has somebody trying to force her to kiss him for money. Um, what we're seeing in this moment is that the subject or our narrator is only there to show us how problematic the way men look at women are. And the actual centers of this narration are these three women and how they're just trying to survive in this very male, very patriarchal and very problematic society that has been wrecked by the Vietnam War, has been wrecked by this patriarchal society and is stipulated by this perception that women should be commodified and objects to be used and enjoyed. And so the subject is much less of a coherent identity, but rather a perspective for us to look at this situation and experience through their eyes. So what I want you guys to do is I want to suggest that you pick one of the prescribed stories. And I want you to discuss, firstly, how the story may or may not lack a clear subject. This should be quite easy because all of them really lack a clear subject. Um, with the exception perhaps of Claire in So Much Water So Close to Home. And I want you to talk also about how the story is incredibly fragmented. So it doesn't need to be a full essay, but it should be about a page long, and you can do it in sort of two longer paragraphs. And I would suggest you pick one story just because you can be very clear on it um, and engage with these issues in sufficient depth. So you really need to engage with it in, in enough complexity. Um, and one of the things that you need to make sure you're doing is quote to support your claim. So don't just paraphrase, actually take quotations out to show how um, how the story is fragmented, how there's a, a dramatic transition from one moment to the other, or how there is a lack of clear subject, how we don't even know the main character's name in some of these stories. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of little pieces of useful stuff for you to engage with. The first is, um, this is actually Raymond Carver reading what we talk about when we talk about love. I know it's not one of the stories you're doing, but it is nice to listen to the actual author reading his work. There's a documentary on Raymond Carver's life, which is helpful. Um, and then here there is a discussion and a reading aloud of Cathedral and Careful, two texts which are part of the extended reading list, but are always good to engage with because it's always nice to have that little bit of extra assistance if you guys want to engage with some of the other readings. Okay, and on that note, I will see you guys in the next video.